Good evening, everyone. I welcome all of you for this uh, session on research uh, methodology. Uh, let me, uh, I'm Dr. Saraswati from Poro Ragarwal Eye Hospital. I'm happy to share the fact that I uh, recently submitted my uh, thesis for PhD with Anna University. At least it's always for me that I'm kind of a uh, bit eligible to be in this esteemed group of scientists and academicians and uh, clinicians. So let me formally introduce you to uh, our uh, panelists. Uh, first, Dr. Uh, Professor Rehubert Anandan. He's the chair professor at Agar Agarwal's Eye Hospital and Postgraduate Institute of Ophthalmology, Thirnaveli. And he received his pharma degree from Anamala University in 2004. And there was no looking back from there. He did his PG from uh, Raja Mutaya College. And uh, a year later, uh, he uh, joined Darwin Eye Care System as the group head of clinical research. After six years of experience in FDA uh, clinical trials, uh, medical device clinical trials, and medical writing, he joined with Dr. Agarwal's Eye Hospital, Thirnaveli, in 2011. He acquired his uh, PhD from uh, in uh, clinical epidemiology uh, from Manon Maniam Sundaram University, Pirna Valley. Currently, he is the head of academics and research, DNB course coordinator, nodal officer to NDE, professor in clinical pharmacology, human ethics committee member of Dr. Agarwal's Eye Hospital, IRB, senior consultant in research at Dr. Agarwal's Eye Hospital, Thirnal Valley. Uh, among his various awards, he's been awarded the Chair Professorship by the National Institute of Health, Zari, among others. And also, interestingly and proudly, he's one of the director in Tamil Nadu Cancer Screening Project, awarded and uh, funded by the Tamil Nadu Innovation and Initiatives, State Planning Commission, Government of Tamil Nadu. His interests are in the clinical trials of drugs and medical devices, clinical epidemiology, public health, preventive oncology, and novel drug delivery system in corneal disease. Quite a CV, quite an experience. I'm also very thrilled to uh, hear from him because my uh, PhD was also on nano carriers. So I'm also looking eagerly towards uh, this session. And the other uh, panelist is Dr. Nagaraj, uh, who holds a PhD in uh, scientist in biostatics from ICMR Chandrapur. He has more than 13 years of research experience with 50 uh, publications. And he's interested in biostats, epidemiology, survival analysis, ophthalmology, entomology, spatial modeling. So with the introduction of our panelists, I would like to introduce our uh, uh, speaker for today, Dr. Divya Ashok, who is a good friend of mine and an uh, excellent clinician, apart from a uh, very good uh, researcher. And she has more than um, 120 PubMed indexed article, articles and uh, something like uh, 3,000 uh, citations in ResearchGate and 5786 citations in Google Scholar. And all of the uh, the H index is uh, uh, 27 in ResearchGate and Google Scholar is 33. And she has a certified course in thinking critical and randomized control trial from Stanford School of Medicine and a certified course in antibacterial stewardship. And the proud thing is she's a section editor in antivirus segment in the esteemed Indian Journal of Ophthalmology. So she has uh, a lot of uh, workshops and she has conducted a uh, lot of in-house workshops uh, to her uh, credit. Now I invite uh, Dr. Divya Ashok to share her experiences and I request all of our participants to actively uh, involve in this uh, webinar and uh, ask their questions either directly or through me and get the wealth of knowledge uh, to understand what forms the basis of a robust and uh, a credible research. Uh, now I hand over it to Dr. Divya Ashok. Thank you, Dr. Saraswati. I uh, thank you, Dr. Preeti and Clinical Board for inviting me for the session. And I thank the panelists for uh, immediately accepting the invitation as well. As we all know, research is part of our uh, 
wrote in curriculum from our MBBS, even in post-graduation. But after coming to our job or becoming a consultant, slowly we move away the research work. But if you see on a long term, this keeps us moving or removes the boredom what we have in the routine life. So it is something like moving forward. So understanding the basic the concept of today's topic was just a beginning to the research and a little bit on the study designs and sampling. So that the beginners or the learners, the new consultants can move themselves from the fear of research and they can go ahead in the learning process. So basically research is moving from known to unknown. And it is an organized inquiry carried out to provide information for solving and problem. Why should someone do a research? There are a few stages where somebody does the research. Sometimes you can do it as an eagerness to know more on a topic or a curriculum like a dissertation or thesis in college. Sometimes additional prerequisite for promotions as a professional requirement in companies and factories for index monitoring in government and public sectors, sometimes in job opportunities, and many times it is hobby or passion. What is the basic thing which affects everyone who moves before they go into research is the fear. Where to start, whom to approach, and how to do. So there will be a lot of questions in the mind, the student or the beginners, to how to start, what is, to, or they have a, thought of doing a research or doing some academic work or move into something which they want to innovate but there is always a fear in their mind so let me show some of these things which has triggered some observations or innovations and in minds as you all know the very path breaking thing of microbiology is the invention of uh, the penicillin, which is by Alexander Fleming, where he noted an observation in his lab. There was some mold which was producing some substance which was preventing the growth of the bacteria, named it as an antibacterial. It was just an observation. So the, an observation can be, bring you closer to a motive or uh, your intention to do something new. Or sometimes like persistent thinking. If you see the discovery of DNA, the DNA discovery has gone through many people. Like it's not the first that Watson Crick discovered it. There have been people who have been moving on it, finding out what is the difference, where are the codes present, how they are transported of one generation to other generation. So it is a thinking of persistence which was there from people to people, from generation to generation that brought out the theory of this DNA. Another example is observation. As you can see, there is a treatment for malaria, which is the chinchona alkaloid. Actually, it was noted people like who are been in the war and they have been uh, uh, gone to places where they couldn't have any help. They have seen people in closer to some part of the river which had the trees with the chinchona alkaloid bar they prevented them from getting fever. So they noted this bar as of the tree has got something which is unique. So they noted it and their observation on a long term brought us the antimicrobial, that is the anti-malarial. You can also have it in ophthalmology discovery where you see observations where the Charles Kelman noted in it. So the same thing can be in ophthalmology where you have seen Charles Kelman coming out with the invention of phacomalsification after he saw the dentist using the probe to remove the, that uh, part from the tooth. So the characteristics of basic research can vary. It depends from person to person, uh, like institute to institute, but basically it will be in one format. Either it is empirical or systematic, controlled fashion, and it is the ideal method to employ an hypothesis and find out whether it works. It should be analytical, where you do a critical analysis of all data used. So there is no error in the interpretation. You have an objective, unbiased, and logical finding, then it is more of good research. You always employ a quantitative methodology and do statistical tests to confirm your observation. 
so before going into any any topic you will always have a question it's always a question or sometimes a goal or an aim which moves you towards your identification what you are going to do if you see the overall in ophthalmology there have been a trends of studies or experimental trials which have moved from 1960s to 2000 so this is a database from harvard which shows there is improving control trials happening in ophthalmology and it was uh, like it almost uh, like other specialties where it has shown there is a control trials or experimental studies yeah okay now in ophthalmology as such there has been a moving trend towards the randomized control trial that is what an harvard study is is an index which shows from the 1960s to 2000 there is a moving trend as you can see the graph is increasing there, that means many people or many uh, institutions and they have been motivated people coming out with the control trials so if you see the analysis of the specialty wise in the ophthalmology you get a lot of uh, reports from retina and uh, as it moves on the uh, other parts like lens lacrimal orbital rcts are there so in the overall there are there is a increase from 1% to 12% during the years of 1980 to 1999 and it is comparable to other specialties and even after doing so much of work there are still lot of deficiencies which have been noted in evidence based publication in clinical ophthalmology so how can one proceed with the type of research and how they can move on if they have a concept if they have a thinking process that they are going to do there are various methods in which they can proceed with their observation or their thought process so it can be classified either descriptive or analytical applied or fundamental quantitative or qualitative conceptual or empirical so to get a primary idea of what you are going to do you have to do a basic research or a field research to find out what your process what is the literature is telling and what you already know whether it is correct or not that yeah, literature yeah. search comes first basic research plan will be your problem uh, statement which you have then you go to the relevant literature search and you find out the hypothesis to define the hypothesis and find out whether it is true or is there any difference in your thought process and the final you do the investigations then you do the statistics and discuss on the topic so you can have any topic like from starting from the incidence cause factors common effects risk factors prognosis cost based epidemiology you should have two things before you enter either you have aim that is what you are going to what is the strategy what you are going to find out what you are going to achieve then few steps how you are going to achieve what are the objectives the steps we take to get into the goal and you go through a literature search there are a few steps in literature search also like you write a protocol writing the methods where you find out whether the same study has been done before related things done and the basics before anatomy and uh, related newer works you can go through in uh, your sources sources could be books journals abstracts scientific presentations there are search engines like pubmed just for the juniors to know you can go through science direct or scopus to find out when you review things always go by step by step with your concept against your concept or totally alternative things you can uh, do it so starting from anatomy to statistics always keep stay on the top of the literature suppose you are on the topic of doing an armd you should have a alerts of the table of contents coming out in journals and publications and abstracts so that that will keep you into the literature always if you are doing almost of two years your study period means you keep in line with the things happening around for example if you go and so just to show for the juniors where how to search we go in the pubmed you type a keyword in the search engine like this like age related macular degeneration we will have lot of papers coming out and you can actually filter it out if you want to get it into the recent and because this, this decade or the next decade you can have in the left hand column like here you have one year five years and 10 years you can filter it you can also use options like open access open access is that where you get the online pdf available so you can go into it click on the pdf and you always get the related references see in references also there are various ways of presenting references where you can see here the ama way where you of the journal followed by year so you should know the volume and issue there right now you have lot of digitalized references and available search engines but previously in our days where we go to the library to find out the journals we should know the volume and issue so that we get into it 
So as you can see, there are other search engines available. You can also have the citations clicked here. So it will give you the number of citations for that. Always do a cross reference. It's not like you do only on your topic and, uh, and you don't do the related surrounding cross references. It is better to do a cross reference and go into the literature search per se. You should have a primary study design in which you will put your hypothesis to to the evaluation. There are a lot of study designs available, almost 20 study designs are there, but you should crossly know what it will fall, what your topic will fall, whether it is a case series or comparison, observational or interventional, randomized or non-randomized, is the case control or cohort, so either it is prospective or retrospective, blinded or cross-sectional. And uh, there are types of study as I classified before as descriptive and analytical. Just to give a word, descriptive is you're not doing anything. You're just describing what is happening about a disease or an event which is there in the population. That's either by surveys or question as you find out. So it's a descriptive. Analytical is analyze. You get the data, then you analyze, do a critical evaluation. Applied or fundamental. Applied is finding out the, you know, suppose you have a uh, problem and you are finding out something to as a solution for that problem, it's an applied research. Fundamental is you're not going to have an immediate implication, but you're doing a research on the aspects or findings. So descriptive, as I told you, the, the occurrence or outcome analytical is identifying the association between the exposure and outcome. Descriptive would be various ways, starting from report series and epidemiology. Analytical would be more uh, like as acetic falls into the main experimental or gold standard. Now, other groups will be the cohort, case control, crossover study, cross-sectional, and ecological study. As compared to the time frame, you could also divide it as perspective. That means looking forward. At one point, you stand and move forward and look into the future what happens to the events for a disease or an event. Then you say it's perspective. If you go, go back and see like oh, you have a disease and see what happened to this patient before, what he having any exposure or was he using on drugs, is retrospective going back in time. So the study sequence, like you form an hypothesis seeing series of patients, descriptive epidemiology, case reports, and you form an hypothesis. But testing the hypothesis, you have to go for the experimental trials. So what is an hypothesis? Hypothesis is a statement which has to be proven. So it's just an assumption that is made on the basis of some evidence as you, you have been exposed to like in your time frame, in your OPD or in your literature where you have an hypothesis and you want to prove it. For example, a drug A causes side effect of X than drug B or a risk factor you want to find for certain population. You can have a lot of sources. A characteristic should be, it has to be clear and precise. Your hypothesis is specific for what you are going to find out and it make it as simple as possible. Like you have various hypotheses, like simple, complex, directional. You need not go deeper into it, but you should know what your statement is and how you are going to have a uh, statement proven or not proven. So functions, why do sh should someone have is to make an observation, makes experiments possible, and it becomes a standpoint for the investigation. Suppose you're doing an investigation related to your evaluation. For anything, for example, if you want to find out a disease event or a side effect of a drug for a newer invention, you should have a standpoint. So you make an hypothesis. And for verifying the observation, whether it's correct, you're doing the right direction or not. So in this image, again, it shows the development of the hypothesis, investigation, and defining the exposure. Finally, you'll go into the clinical trial to prove it. So some of the uh, examples we see are the case reports for descriptive newer uh, diseases or link between diseases, therapeutic events, and advanced events. Suppose you have a tuberculoma in a horizontal gaze palsy. First time somebody is reporting, you call it as a report. You have a series of events, so for example, due to the intraocular lens the complication or to do the drug which is producing corneal toxicity you follow these patients identify there is something unique to the condition and which has not been reported is presented as a case series so the disadvantage also you should know see these are all one or two reports you cannot generalize in the population so you, you collect more patients and do an experimental analysis that is where your uh, analytical part of your study comes so analytical is experimental and observational. Experimental is the gold standard, which is the RCT and community trials. Observational could be an individual data collection like cohort, case control, and case cost work. Experimental studies is where intervention occurs. You intervene and you have a controlled group. Control group is a non-intervene group. They are just like that. They are not taking the treatment. Where the intervention group is the 
new drug or any treatment being given so here you have two groups where one is being treated with a newer thing the other one is not treated so there is a, actually a good control you already have so this is a planned research design and it is a most well known experimental design as compared to the observational studies it is non experimental and no individual intervention is given it there is an existing non control environment you just see that observation and analyze it coming to the cross sectional studies you see the image uh, incidents happening at one point of time uh, where there is a disease and the exposure suppose let, let us take one population where there is a no disease and disease and you see some are having some risk factor some are not having the risk factor so this is the cross section study it is happening in a population you observe and analyze so usually for community surveys it measures prevalence of the disease not suitable for studying rare or highly fatal diseases or a disease with short duration of expression coming to when you say prevalence and cross sectional you should know what is incidence and prevalence incidence is the number of new cases of disease during a specified period of time suppose you have a new population developing as compared to the prevalence where the number of existing diseases and the new both together will come into the prevalence that is the difference so there are a lot of uh, studies which will tell you of the cross sectional for example you want to know this is a study in northern sweden where they compared the diabetes mellitus in a population of uh, in from 94 to 95 it's a prevalence study same way in a localized area like in goa they have studied in diabetic retinopathy it's a prevalence where they have studied cross sectional disadvantage is it is weak as observational design measures prevalence not incidence and it 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 uh, it will not tell you actually about the exposure effect and usually don't know when disease occurred rare events and quick emerging diseases are a problem for this the other observational uh, trial is the case control study where you will have exposure data collected retrospectively most feasible design where disease outcomes are rare so you have a case control where cases have the disease and controls which do not have the disease as you can see here you have a population and uh, you have the exposure factor present and absent they have some of them have disease some of them don't have disease and you analyze at that time point so the strength is less expensive time consuming efficient for studies of rare diseases but when it comes for uh, not known you know prevalence for disease when the disease itself is not known it that's a limitation exposure measurements taken after disease occurrence and disease status can influence the selection of subjects so again you can have an armd where the risk factor is calculated comparing the normal controls and the patients who don't have the risk factors so here you have the odds ratio being measured in case control where there exposure and n exposed so this formula gives you the odds ratio that is uh, the disease cases and no disease controls so this formula when it is determined whether the exposure related to the disease or not so if you calculate uh, the odds of more than one it shows that higher odds of the disease and if it is less than one there is less, lesser odds of the disease due to the exposure that is what you get if it is equal and equal means there is exposure and the disease uh, or not due to the risk factor you can also have a case case crossover studies where one the same patient before the trigger will be as a case before the trigger will be as a control and after he gets the trigger he becomes a case so the same patient crosses over so it's called case crossover for example if patient with wheezing or bronchi bronchitis in the uh, before exposure to the allergen it will be he will be in the control group and later becomes in the case group that's a case crossover design in air pollution epidemiology so you can do that for conditions suitable for studying like individual exposure varies within a short time it is not for long duration short time duration if it changes or affects such conditions can be taken it has got an abrupt onset and short latency for detection and induction period is short cohort study are also a good observational study and looking uh, at it you like you have an odds ratio for the case control you can have the risk incidence in the cohort study then this is the best observational study as compared to the all others like the cross sectional case control and cohort so the study begins with the population free of disease then you have the factors and see who is developing the disease who is not so moving forward in the prospective manner in the future we identify so uh, this is the prospective you can also have a retrospective where you from the outcome you find whether these patients were exposed to the disease before so it is a retrospective cohort so here you see the relative risk like you had an odds ratio here you have the risk the risk of developing the disease from the exposure the relative risk more than one that means the risk have increased due to the factor and if it is less it is less 
strengths exposure uh, strengths and limitations if you see exposure status determined before disease detection and subjects selected before disease detection and can study several outcomes for each exposure it's not only suppose a patient is for example the common uh, thing we say for the risk factors for armd suppose if you say smoking for any other food intake uh, genetics so you have multiple risk factors coming out limitation is expensive and time consuming inefficient for rare disease or diseases with long latency and loss to follow yeah, this is an example of a myopia prevalence in uh, Shanghai being reported 52%. So they had to do a uh, study on that. They uh, to, took parameters like uh, spherical equivalent and axillary evaluation. So they have found out over the time period how these children have evaluated. Four years evaluation they have done and they have noted how, what is the change in the spherical equivalent and axillary. RCT is a clinical trial, as we have already discussed much on this. So you have a treatment group and com com comparison group. And you should uh, to, uh, cannot use actually this for any harmful conditions because of ethical reasons. If you feel the drug is effective and it is not causing any harm, then only this uh, trial can be. That means the safety is more important, the ethical point of view. So for all these conditions, you need sampling. So sampling is uh, taking the subject from the population, the subset of the population. And you select the population and you have to determine the sample size. It's a very rare condition. If the prevalence is very less, you can have a lesser population. But if it is very common diseases, so there are multiple factors determined. For example, census for smaller population, prevalence, then you can, you can identify how much is needed by doing a table which is already put, that is a published table. Or you can also use a mathematical formula for determining it. So it is affected by type of research, confidence interval, total population, and precision. Always the rule of thumb is larger the sample, more statistically significant the analysis would be. This is a common sample size calculated uh, formula where you can see here that n is the population size, e is the margin of error, and z, z score. So uh, z score is the number of standard deviation given proportions away from the mean. So z score varies for the confidence interval. For 99% confidence interval, you will have 2.5. That means more 99% uh, of your data will be in the general population where the Z score is 2.5. So it is always to have a higher confidence interval like 95 and 99. Margin of error indicates how much you are willing for your sample to differ from your general population. From the population. So margin of error has to be limited. Again, confidence interval we talked about, it has to be kept under 25, 95 to 99%. So that will give you the better uh, population. Uh, you can actually predict this to the general population. There are almost calculator uh, available in the uh, net also, internet calculator, where you can put the confidence interval margin of error and population. As you can here see, the population size, if you mention, it is select your sample size. So it is online uh, available calculators can also be used. In selection of samples, you have to be uh, very careful whether you are going to randomize because in randomization, obviously, you're going to randomize. In the method of randomization also, they differ. You can have a simple random, systematic, cluster, and stratified. Simple random, like you name the for a classroom or a number of patients in an OPD, you have to randomly select the patients. Like a random number generator, you can generate and take it up or stratify them depending upon their age group or fresh or old patients like that, you stratify them and select. Or cluster, you divide the group into clusters. For example, you want to select, a, if here I have put a, uh, like a play, a flights of the passenger you have to take, like you have to select so many flights and all the passengers. Same way you have to select so many groups in this uh, OPD or so many patients in this date or this month will be taken. That is a cluster. So that group will be taken to the cluster sample. Or systematic random, like every nth patient, like every 10th patient or every 20th patient will be taken, that is systematic random. That is experimental design for randomization. After you randomize, then you intervene them and you have one control and analyze what is their outcome over the time period. That is the experimental design. Few things you have to note down. This randomization will reduce some of the bias which happens like uh, confounding factors, matching bias, blinding, all takes place at the selection level itself, population selection level, before you get start on to the intervention. So the advantages of our randomization is blinding, reduces selection bias, concealment and allocation reduces, again, selection bias, because no one knows where the patient going into, into the treatment or the other group. 
reduces confounding bias, prospectively no recall bias and strongest level of evidence can be obtained. So this is an example how a confounding factor can act in selection. Suppose you say the exposure to smoking and causes retinal microangiopathy and the patient is also having high blood cholesterol, it is a confounding factor. That is what you have to rule out the confounding factor in your studies. Disadvantage is RCT, as I tell, a lot of things being done here. There is a, a lot of cost needed, but very expensive, and it may not be useful for very harmful uh, treatment thing, not appropriate to certain types of questions when it may be unethical to assign persons to treat or comparison groups. So these are some of the major RCTs which has come out, uh, especially in diabetes. A lot of them on diabetes and ARMDs have come, come out in the recent past. And uh, uh, this uh, shows there are a lot of uh, RCTs being cited also, as you can see that it gives you the gold standard for experimental designs. I think we come to the end of the session, uh, more on this uh, designs and sampling. Uh, to be honest, it's a very dry subject, but you made it very interesting. Uh, just to uh, make it as a zest, what I would say is, if at all anybody is interested in research, you go with the question. And then find out what is the uh, literature available, what is the lacunae there. And with that, you probably take the assistance of a statistician as to how much sample you need, what is the p-value you need and other things. So with that, you can uh, uh, proceed in a systematic manner. And Dr. Preeti has asked one interesting question like uh, how to keep the references. So to my knowledge, we have a lot of uh, digital things there are various ways of uh, uh, referencing. You have to find out what is the recommended method of recommendation for your particular institute or for a, a, a journal you are aiming to. And there are some Mendelian and uh, Zotero. Thrix, Zotero, Thrix kind of uh, places where you can put the reference and it will give the format you want. So all you have to do is go to the journal and click the cite button. It pops up with the citation. And it also gives the methodology in which it is cited. If it is uh, straight to the what you are requirements, you can just copy paste it. Or you can go back to this one of these sites and change it to the format you require and keep it as a separate referencing section. And I would recommend people to have a digital logbook kind of wherein you keep all your um, data all your referencing, all your uh, journals and other things. Give this to other panelists to add upon and uh, make it more uh, clearer to newer people who want to venture into research. Yeah, yes. I, as uh, you said, li library, like Mendelian library is there where uh, they can use that. And Zotero is there. I think Dr. Heber sir will uh, talk on it. Websites which help. Yes, uh, Sotiro is a good uh, solution. It is a in between uh, add on add on thing for a Microsoft Pad. If you, uh, it is not necessary for you to install as a separate software, uh, but it can be added into a Microsoft Pad. So it is in, uh, it will become a inbuilt inbuilt kind of thing. Whenever you uh, you can copy paste your reference, uh, Zotero will uh, look into that. Go, we, you can use the Zotero from your Microsoft Pad. So if you ask our librarian, Mr. Raja, he will help you uh, to install that uh, package or uh, add-on things uh, into your uh, Microsoft Pad. It will be very simple uh, Simple when comparing with Mendeley and all, it is very simple. And anything to add on, uh, Dr. Nagraj, in a statistical aspect on sampling, which you want to say? Uh, yes, yeah, sir. Statistics is one nightmarish thing for everyone. So please add on something uh, to elevate. Uh, yes, ma'am. So uh, actually, Dr. Divya, ma'am, uh, give the wonderful lecture on research methodology. I don't know if this is a good way. Uh, so in, in my point of view, uh, in most of the clinical studies come, comes under the ophthalmological side, mostly the, they will not go to the field based study. They mostly collect the samples from the patients. So in uh, right manner is the we want to reduce the bias so we want to increase the randomization 
So we want to follow the exact research methodology that is a right solution how to we complete the successful studies. So mostly it's a sample size calculations. Um, uh, um, I, I earlier I discussed with mostly the students come after complete the study they will come to the statistician and say we have only these samples we can't achieve the full sample size how to manage it. So we want to uh, reduce this errors. Now this this is a error sub uh, maybe called the bias. So that's why at the time of the sample size calculation, we give the non we add the non-response rate and also type one error, type two error. Even so, before the start of the study, the non-statistician better discuss with the some statistician, get a clear idea about the sample size calculation and research methodology. And also sometimes I, I face that some primary objective of the study is different. They calculating the sample size is different. Uh, that also the uh, maybe the, the DNB panels and also the panel members, they may be reject their thesis due to this. So before start the study, you can get clear idea about the what is our outcome, what is our hypothesis, what the test we want to do, what statistical test is the right way, what sample size is the, uh, we can choose for the right sampling, how do we reduce the bias. So then we tell, these are the techniques should be just we can uh, read some, a lot of the journals are there, they can clearly explain uh, how do the medical uh, candidates uh, successfully complete the thesis and this work. So uh, most of the things are available just you can uh, before start the study you can just read the research methodology and the sampling and sample size it will be a better idea to complete successfully this is uh, dr divya i have a question like uh, you have showed there are uh, online tools to select the sample size similarly are there any tools to at least approximately tell you uh, say for example if i have a question like i'm i want to uh, follow uh, the risk factors for diabetic retinopathy or a particular risk factor for diabetic retinopathy for five years or something like that and I put that question. Will it suggest me like you can uh, do a prospective study or a retrospective study? That is one thing. Or if I already have decided I'm going to do a prospective or ret a retrospective, are there any tools to suggest, okay, uh, you probably need to have uh, this kind of a sample size, you might have to do this kind of test. Is there anything like that? Uh, yeah, Saraswati, now to, because of this digitalized world, you have this artificial intelligence coming up and doing a lot of research work uh, where you have this chat GPT and all give you the research question which you want. It immediately searches and finds out what all studies have been done. So you can use the AI in uh, getting your uh, like uh, how it can be done. That is there. Uh, but uh, as such, you should uh, have your own hypothesis. It will not give you the hypothesis. See, AI will give you when, uh, what are all the limitations. You can ask what is a lack in A, what is the limitation. Exactly. The, See. Exact the statement, what you want to find out, you have to get the details from the AI and then you have to postulate your theory. But yeah. you can the have AI assisted. Uh, it can help you in your formation of your question. No, I, I'm uh, that that's clear. I'm talking in terms of uh, selecting no, the type no of website stats, as such. stats. Statistical. There is no website ah. as such. Yeah. You, okay. Uh, yeah, you have. You have to, to go out. back to the mm. articles and find out. Yeah, okay, find out fine, what has fine. been done prior and do it. So maybe it's a good idea to once you have a decent idea on an abstract of your thinking, probably you can involve the statistician at an earlier yes. Uh, stage. Yes, yes. Yeah. So that, that is what uh, do. you wouldn't have to regret. Yeah. yeah. Got First it. First you yep. find out the literature and find out if you want mm -hmm. the strongest evidence. See, it's all about evidence based medicine. Correct. If you want the strongest evidence, you have to go for the experimental thing first. Okay. But you cannot go directly to an experiment. Before that, you have to do a pilot study for your thing. Suppose Correct. your concept is there. Do a pilot study, get a case series, then you go to the third level, do an experimental trial. Okay. Great. Dr. Heber, you want to add anything? Yes, madam. Yes, madam. You are correct. So, madam also told safety is important for face, uh, sorry, RCTs. Uh, that is correct. Because in clinical trial of uh, USFDA clinical trials, IND trials we are doing, so phase one is always we are giving importance to the safety. So that also will do in healthy volunteers only. We are not touching the patients. If it is okay in a single site, then we will go for a phase two for the efficacy. Then only we will check the efficacy. And that also in limited population, single arm study, maybe 
ஃபிஃப்டி பேஷன் ஃபிஃப்டி டூ டூ ஃபிஃப்டி பேஷன்ட் இன் ஃபேஸ் த்ரீ ஓன்லி தே வில் டூ எ வெரி லார்ஜ் ரேண்டமைஸ் கண்ட்ரோல் ட்ரையல் ஆஃப்டர் எஸ்டாப்ளிஷிங் தி சேஃப்டி அண்ட் எஃபிகேசி இன் லிமிடெட் பாப்புலேஷன் ஸோ மேடம் இஸ் கரெக்ட் அண்ட் ஒன் மோர் திங் ஐ வுட் லைக் டு ஆட் இன் ரெஃபரன்ஸ் செக்ஷன் ஸோ இட் இஸ் வெரி இம்பார்ட்டன்ட் வி நீட் டு ஹேவ் ரீசன்ட் ரெஃபரன்சஸ் தே ஆல்வேஸ் த எடிட்டர்ஸ் தே லுக் ஃபார் தட் ரீசன்ட் மீன்ஸ் இட் ஷுட் பி வி நீட் டு கிவ் இம்பார்ட்டன்ஸ் டு தி பப்ளிக் ஸ்டடீஸ் வித்இன் டூ இயர்ஸ் டூ இயர்ஸ் Uh, if i am doing a study in 2024 why i need to provide uh, recent study details like 22 23 what are the studies uh, are done in the uh, i can found find in the literature and more than 50 percentage 50 percentage of the studies uh, uh, from my references should be uh, within the 5 years of uh, publication so we need to we, we cannot uh, uh, show the previous very long back study so that yes. is very important now actually Indeed, some journals fine. they expect they always put a star mark for the first decade that means one decade and two decades more recent would be the better like you show a yes. lot of recent references they give more preference for that yes madam can i add something yeah yes yes madam Uh, sometimes uh, we start to study this study is ongoing we may feel uh, we are going in the right way or not so that time we can we want to do something so that is mean in term analysis the the time re, re, uh, resampling the re estimate the sample size based on their what the data we currently have so if you are planning to the sample size 300 we are the midway of the journey so we can use, use the technique the interim analysis or the re uh, estimation the sample size so based on the our result we can re, the, no, recent days these are the approved techniques are available we can utilize this kind of techniques now that's what interim analysis is what you said is correct yes. in between you do and find out whether your sample size is actually getting us the results or not yes 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 correct they are called as uh, adaptive stand- study designs madam yes. shared the uh, very important uh, basic study designs in the presentation it was interesting so what nagarjan saying it's adaptive study design during this uh, during uh, the process of study ongoing of the study we can change the uh, sample size and we can change uh, uh, the study design also many advanced study designs are so available to reduce the burden to understand no so I, i am planning the study with 300 patients if it really after starting the study in uh, statistically it is not needed 200 is okay then why should i uh, uh, tax the patient uh, give burden to the patient and uh, cost effective so we can we have adaptive study designs uh, dr anand would you like to add something about your patent on uh, drug design and you have mentioned something about the content out of curiosity yeah yes madam uh, the, for deeper uh, and uh, corneal infections we are uh, uh, we, we have we have developed a uh, <coughs> uh, sustained uh, kind of uh, sustained release study uh, drug de- delivery system madam because for topical we need to routinely use uh, in P- we have to use uh, uh, more frequency of study administration so that is very difficult for the patient and that may lead to non compliance even intrastromal injections also it is uh, it has it has its own uh, complication and topical they have uh, uh, strife side effects also so we we are uh, have a uh, intrastromal drug delivery system madam so it is a drug matrix it releases the uh, dr- drug slowly uh, into the infected area and uh, we pr- we prove that uh, this is working better than the topical and intrastromal injections madam was it an rct sir uh, no rct R- rct also we have, we, have, we tried madam uh, and we found it's very interesting and uh, we published in lot of conferences ao and european yeah. uh, it was it a device or a, a polymer coating kind polymer, of polymer polymer madam polymer, polymer. Madam. polymer. Polymer, okay polymer, it was polymer. so and how did you prove the entry of the drug did you use any uh, uh, confocal or uh, live imaging uh, how did you do that uh, clinically you... madam uh, yes correct you are correct clinically ah. uh, clinical trial clinical uh, uh, in some uh, efficacy uh, measured uh, and we uh, we did a drug retention study also madam pharmacokinetic kind of thing drug retention study using anterior chamber uh, anterior segment oct also madam with using a asoct
okay right yes. quite interesting quite interesting mm. good we need to travel more madam to make this available to all the people <laughs> <laughs> yeah sure it is, sure. Uh, it is challenging madam because we are clinical people and we are working in uh, uh, hospitals so this kind of uh, preparation of polymer and we are uh, hmm. we to bring it forth it is a Correct. challenge madam. we definitely need a collaboration with the pharma company and uh, it, it is interesting interesting and challenging madam yeah challenging. that's what uh, we have to emphasize at some point about the basic uh, research also because uh, all this uh, uh, improvement in publication all this is, is more on the clinical point of view yes. so the molecular level basic uh, research also has to take up that's when uh, things would uh, change what do you think dr uh, divya yeah see uh, as you said the molecular level uh, thinking and uh, doing investigations uh, should improve and i, I think it, it is all in the process the people are changing from that uh, gross aspect or a broad aspect now are making, becoming more like a precise in making uh, things so i think in future we will all move into it where you make it uh, like a, what do you say more like a microscopic level of thinking making a very precise picture of the disease or treatment process and we have investigations like oct and all coming up higher end resolution so i think it will be like in future uh, it will help us going more into the microscopic point and uh, what do you say nano point of it and like a yes, correct madam genomics and proteomics now we are starting with uh, we, we have given a topic uh, in our two our pgs also uh, it is interesting madam so we need to move on with the as uh, dr madam says we need to move on with genomic studies and proteomic studies also it is really wonderful and it helps us in uh, uh, pinpoint diagnosis of that particular disease madam and it will help us for uh, focused treatment personalized treatment yeah so that's been a uh, that's been a wonderful session if there's nothing more to add uh, if anybody is interested in asking questions uh, uh, participants can go ahead otherwise uh, we can wind up the session for yeah. today it's i would like to add a few things i really want to thank panelist uh, dr nagaraj and uh, professor uh, hebaran and our speaker for the day dr divya this is just a beginning of understanding research this is what i would try to tell we are going to have the plan for us was not to uh, comprise all the topics into one go we wanted to take it step by step uh, we know there is lot of statistics which uh, has what clearly pointed out by dr nagaraj that none of us try, uh, seem to understand it to that extent and uh, uh, it is really mind boggling to even think about what test we should do in a particular uh, study or a particular uh, topic which we want to write so we would like to know more about it i think that will come in eventually in the next uh, few sessions so this session uh, as i understand that we have covered the types of study design which dr divya has said a little more in detail by uh, about the randomized control trials by uh, uh, professor heber and uh, um, uh, a view on uh, the statistics how important it is to start it in the beginning and not in the end at least try to have a midway analysis and going forward i think the next session uh, will be more uh, interesting um, probably more focused towards uh, ophthalmology and our uh, tough calls wherein how to write a paper what do you look into case report the reason why i asked where do you store these references is most of them what happens is we keep preferring for something we do not know where to store it and we do not know how to label it like which comes first which comes second so the software application if it can be explained more in detail also would be very beneficial to the uh, people who are listening to this so um, saying that uh, anything dr divya you would like to add about what is going to be our next session for the benefit of people who are listening that will help us uh, understand more as what we are going to do in the next evolving sessions in research methodology yeah uh, yeah today we saw about the basics just an introduction because people will be feared to know the what is methodology session many many of them will not be uh, will be actually a first timer to see this so it's just an introduction maybe we'll uh, recap uh, together with the uh, data analysis referencing little bit on referencing as you said how to store it and writing a protocol that could be the second part 
data management that is basic sure dr divya and any take home points from dr nagaraj thank you for uh, coming and joining us uh, on invite uh, really nice to have you here but we would like to know a little more any take home points which you would like to specifically give our set of audience um ma'am i'm mostly focused i'm also working with the diva ma'am the in the uh, two uh, one year mostly we are facing the issue in the uh, analysis and the uh, sample, sample size so we want to more uh, precise in this uh, on these issues because now we, once we uh, make the uh, less sample size it is a little bias so we can't achieve our uh, right target so my focus on the sample size and sampling is the uh, very uh, important uh, critical in the uh, do the right main way so my point is that way so, so before start the study we want to clear about the uh, uh, research design and sampling techniques what should be we do this is a important thing for the care, starting the early careers mm -hmm. Sure. Thanks, Dr. Nagaraj. Uh, uh, take home points from uh, Professor Heber. Yes, it is a really interesting uh, discussion and thanks for the opportunity. Divya Madam nicely explained the basics of study design. So I want to add uh, to Mr. Dr. Nagarajan, it is very important because statisticians, they know very, very good the statistical point. So we clinical people, you clinical people, you know clinical uh, parameters or clinical terminologies and the uh, need, everything more. So there is a, a gap. That's the reason uh, I think Saraswati Madam told the statistics is a nightmare. Really, it is like that only for we people, clinical people. So uh, as uh, Dr. Nagarajan uh, suggested, definitely we need to have uh, one or two sittings with the like, uh, statistician or clinical epidemiologist uh, in what way we are going to uh, travel uh, in our study path. Another thing is uh, statistical thinking. That's what uh, Preeti Madam uh, explained clearly. Statistical thinking. That is very, very important and uh, it is not a nightmare also, Madam. So in future, if we continue this kind of uh, sessions, definitely we can able to understand the basic statistics like uh, student p-test, uh, RANOVA, or chi-square, uh, basics, ca uh, correlation and all. So it is not a Nightmare, madam. So once we interestingly learn the thing, everybody can understand and they can uh, uh, do. But to, to perform uh, statistical st testing, softwares are available. SPSS and SAS, so many simplified softwares are available. But statistical thinking is more important. What kind of statistical test I am going to yes. use for my hypothesis and uh, for the available data. That is very, very uh, important. So once we learn all the things, before starting the study itself, we can uh, choose which kind of data. Uh, uh, should I need continuous data or uh, uh, ordinal data, uh, gradual data, everything. So in future, if uh, possible, we'll discuss all these things uh, in a sure. simplified manner. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And thanks to, to Dr. Saraswati also who has been moderating the session. And uh, we will soon meet up with the next session um, the, on research methodology maybe in the coming weeks. And thank you all uh, participants for the patient listening. Uh, Dr. Saraswati, over to you to wind the session. Thank you so much, Dr. Preeti and Clinical Board for the opportunity. It's been a really a learning session. And it was wonderful with all the uh, eminent uh, speakers and uh, academic uh, excellence. I thanks again, everyone, and I hope to meet again in the coming sessions. Thanks a lot.